Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session today. My name is Vicky Brewer, and I'm the current Charge News Manager for the CDHB Public Health Nursing Service. My role here today is to help facilitate the session around restrictive eating or AFID in children and supporting children and families. This is a joint session with Mobile Health and the Canterbury Initiative. And we welcome attendees from across New Zealand, including Canterbury, Faroe, Wangarei, and down to Gore. So I'd introduce the speakers today, and the first one is Ursula McCulloch, the consultant clinical psychologist from the CDHB, and Fiona Layton, paediatric dietitian from the CDHB. The format of the session today is um, a 60-minute presentation, which will be facilitated, uh, presented by Ursula and Fiona together, and then we will have a 30-minute question here at the time. So without further ado, I'll hand over to um, Ursula to introduce herself and start the session. Thank you. Kia ora, I'm Ursula McCulloch. I'm a um, consultant clinical psychologist and I currently work in the CAF or Child, Adolescent and Family Children Under Five service, um, but I have very many years of experience working in um, CAF services um, in general, working with mental health difficulties with children up till the age of 18. But importantly, um, I'm here as a member today of the paediatric feeding team, and we're going to be talking about restrictive eating. I'll leave Fiona to introduce herself. Kia ora, I'm Fiona Layton. I'm a paediatric dietitian who was also part of the feeding team, and currently I work at the Child Development Service, um, looking after those children with um, intellectual and physical disabilities. And um, I see a lot of those children with restricted diets who are on the autism spectrum. I've got many years in paediatrics working in Christchurch Hospital and before that numerous roles um, in various specialties. But yes, as um, also Ursula said, I'm part of the feeding team at Canterbury District Health Board. So just to think about picky eating, it's really quite a normal developmental stage for toddlers. So there's been some research um, by Moscola in 2010 that said Somewhere between 80, 8 and 50% of children go through a picky eating phase. So very variable, 8 to 50, but it is common. Um, particularly young children are suspicious about new foods. And um, I love that picture on that slide, which just shows a very typical child struggling with broccoli. Um, and broccoli is a kind of known food that many children struggle with. So we know that some children may go on to develop um, more serious challenging eating difficulties, which I'll talk more about, which is AFID, but many children will outgrow their picky eating stages and often um, families just need to keep on presenting the food to children in a fun way and the children may outgrow their difficulties. Um, when we have concerns or our red flags or when children really have fewer than 20 foods and are dropping their foods, so they have very limited choice, um, when they fail to meet their nutritional needs, so they may need supplementation um, because they're really struggling to fulfill their nutritional requirements. Um, supplementation is something Fiona will talk about later on. They may be missing out on entire food groups, for instance, no fruit or vegetables or no meats and proteins or dairy, or you know, this could be a variety of groups that are missing. And that, of course, adds to why they're struggling to meet their nutritional needs. And we also see children who are really particular about textures um, and they may be very slow to eat and show significant distress around mealtime. So this is picky eating and it becomes more serious in ARFID. So ARFID is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And here we see children who show a lack of interest in food or foods and food is available. And they're often av avoid food due to the sensory properties of the food and they limit their range increasingly. And with these children, we see they don't meet their nutritional needs. And unlike anorexia, they don't have body image distortion and their weight can be in the normal range. What we see with ARFID, it's fussy eating turned up a notch and it begins to impact on their psychosocial functioning, 
It may impact on friendships, ability to go out to parties, have sleepovers, school camps, etc. Um, so this is the group of children we typically see in our pediatric feeding clinic. People want to know why children have ARFID, and there are multi-faceted reasons. Um, sometimes it's one or more of these reasons I'm listing, um, and there may be there's many other reasons that I haven't listed, but these are the most common. Firstly, it's about the sensory properties of food, and often children in the first decade of life um, begin to be more aware of how food is in their mouths and how it feels, how it tastes and the general property of the food. And so they start avoiding foods that they don't like the sensory properties of. And in our clinic, we see lots of children who just prefer easy to eat foods that are brown and crunchy, and they avoid other foods that are that more challenging or wet or require greater chewing, et cetera. And that can be difficult because sometimes those are the food groups that they need are in fruits and vegetables or, um, meats that need chewing, etc. they don't have. We also know that um, the children are super tasters, so partly because they have a limited range, they're very aware of any change in the taste property of food. And also some children are thought to just have a greater sensory awareness of their taste compared to average children. And some research has suggested that children with ARFID are more likely to be super tasters the other issue which can impact, impact on the reason why ARFID happens is um, some type of aversive consequence that, or trauma that can then cause the child to have a very negative association with food. So things like that could be a choking um, event, um, which they then don't want to chew food and then reduce their foods further to no foods that are chewable to only foods that you drink, etc. And we've seen that pattern in our clinic with some of our children. Um, sometimes children have had a traumatic investigation um, in the throat or um, some medical event that is a trauma, um, repeated vomiting, and even reflux, which is really commonly seen in our clinic, that children, babies who've had significant reflux in their early years develop early on a very negative association with foods. And this then develops into ARFID and a restricted range that has um, an impact on their functioning and their meeting nutritional needs. Other children have developmental concerns and Fiona highlighted that she works in the child development service and sees a lot of children on the autism spectrum. And we do see fairly commonly children on the autism spectrum being very rigid about their food types that they eat. And um, this can then go on to develop ARFID. We also know that children who have high levels of anxiety may be very anxious around food and it may go hand in hand with ARFID. Um, we also know that other mental health conditions like um, obsessive compulsive disorder and ADHD also increases the risk of an eating disorder. And we also know that ARFID can increase the risk of developing an eating disorder such as anorexia. So this is a complex business of, um, sort of multiple challenges um, that can impact on a child's relationship with food. Genetics is something that we're aware of. There is a higher rate of um, children with ARFID who have parents with eating disorders, ARFID and anxiety. Um, and environmental and management issues around food impacts on why children may go on to develop ARFID. And we know that parents with the very, very best of intentions can exacerbate a child's fussy eating. Um, and we'll talk more about this later. Just to highlight quickly about anorexia, although we're not talking much about anorexia in, in this particular um, webinar, it's important to know the differences because um, sometimes we need to screen out anorexia. So what we know is with anorexia, there's also a restricted food intake, 
but these children are often highly preoccupied with thoughts of food and the fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, even if they're very thin. Um, in fact, strangely enough, the fear of weight gain can increase even as a child loses weight. Um, for anorexia, it um, more commonly starts in adolescence, but can be as young as seven, as seven and eight, whereas ARFID um, tends to start younger unless there's been a traumatic incident that's um, started it off. Um, in anorexia, there is typically uh, avoidance of food due to weight gain and body image distortion, um, leaving their overweight in, in their body or parts of their body, even though they are not. Although when you do the assessment of this, younger children tend to um, deny or that they don't acknowledge um, the fear of weight gain or body image distortion. Um, with anorexia, you see patterns to interfere with weight gain, um, you know, exercise, water loading, hiding, throwing away foods, pretending they're not hungry. And this is dri driven by fear of gaining weight rather than due to the sensory properties of the food. So with children, there are some issues which make this the treatment of ARFID quite challenging. Um, children don't acknowledge there's a problem. They're perfectly happy with their tiny range and um, they don't want to eat more food. So this is challenging for parents because they're up against their child who's quite happy with their tiny range and it's the parent who wants the range to increase. Children also have extraordinarily developed self-control in limiting their food. Um, and they, children with ARFID typically won't eat rather than eating their preferred food. And so parents are often given advice to starve their child um, and then eventually they will eat the food. But we know with children with ARFID, they would rather not eat than eat their non-preferred food. So um, this is a strategy that doesn't work with the children that have ARFID um, very successfully. Um, there can be quite serious medical concerns related to limited nutrition, and Fiona will talk more about this, but you know, the parents and children need to be aware that it can affect their organs, it can affect eyesight, heart issues, bone density, et cetera. So it has serious consequences. And part of our job as clinicians is to upskill parents on the implications of limited nutrition. And yes, as I said, Fiona will talk more about this. We also know that restricted eating compounds other mental health issues. Um, if you have a restricted diet, it can affect your mood. Anxiety can worsen um, if the brain is not well fed. So while mental health conditions can be partly causal, they can also then be affected by a limited diet. So it's a little bit of a cyclic issue. Range versus volume is something that we come across a lot in the clinic too. Um, so the strategies I'm going to be talking about is more around range because children with restricted diets typically have a very small range. When you talk about volume, you talk about having less food than they need, and it might be through lack of oral motor skills to um, eat foods at a young age, or it could be a variety of other issues. We're not going to be focusing too much on volume in this, but I will just briefly say that with volume, volume you tend to just um, encourage the child to have a little bit more at each meal or at each um, to each time they're eating of their preferred food. Um, range is a different treatment modality. We know that children with ARFID um, can struggle with their relationship with their parent and the parent-child relationship is impacted on by food. Our parents can often feel a failure. Um, they're judged by others and family members. They're often given so much advice um, and they try all the things and it doesn't succeed. The parents can feel quite manipulated by their child and um, there can be quite a fractured parent-child relationship. 
So some repair work sometimes needs to be done to help build the relationship between parents and their children because it's very hard to work with families when there's significant parent-child relationships. And so we need to ensure that families are still having fun, that it's not all about food in the house, that it's not the driving force of the relationship is getting the child to eat because this doesn't help the child's relationship with food. But actually, more importantly, as clinicians, we need to acknowledge to parents that it is a hard journey and we need to empathise with them and not jump into providing yet more advice because these parents have been through a tr terribly tricky time trying to manage their child's eating and have had so much advice and judgment already and we don't want to fall into the same trap of just um, providing more advice without really acknowledging where they've come from and empathising with their position. And that goes a long way towards the treatment. Um, it's acknowledging and empathising first. So I'm going to talk about some strategies to manage um, restricted eating. And I like this slide because it just shows um, the brown and crunchy food that so many of our children like. So firstly, strategies that don't work. We know that force feeding doesn't work. And we also know that many um, children have had experiences of being force fed, particularly when restricted eating starts at a young age. And parents do this with the best of intentions because they're desperate for their child to eat. But we also know that um, the child then develops an unhealthy relationship with food and it's... Um, also impacts on the parent-child relationship. Lengthy meal times, which is more than half an hour, um, isn't helpful because meals then feel like a punishment for a child and that's not helpful for the child. Um, making the child feel guilty about um, you cook for them, that they're not eating. This is not helpful because the children already feel like a failure when it comes to food and um, Food is scary and makes them feel anxious and guilt doesn't change that. It just makes them feel worse. Likewise, comparisons with their siblings who eat or with peers, which is really shaming the child, is another way of making the child feel guilty and doesn't help. We also don't want parents to ignore the issues um, because some children don't outgrow ARFID. Maybe a third would. Um, but um, a third may continue to need supplements and a third will get better slowly and um, we don't know where children are going to fall in that um, and so when you ignore it you potentially are ignoring uh, nutritional risk issues. The other thing we teach parents is not to trick their child into eating foods by sneaking foods and other foods um, because when the children inevitably find out, they will then drop that food from their diet and then the child no longer trusts the parents cooking and other foods can get lost. So this is a very risky uh, thing to try. We also need to teach parents about the avoidance trap um, because of anxiety around food. So eating is a learned behavior and children learn to avoid food driven by the anxiety of trying a non-preferred food. Um, so what happens in this cycle is that the child is anxious and stressed and can become highly distressed when presented with a new food. If the parent allows the child to avoid that food, it can make the child feel better in the interim. And then as parents, we can feel better because our job is to make our children happy and um, be the safe person for them to stop our children feeling unhappy and dysregulated. But unfortunately, this does nothing to uh, combat the anxiety around trying new foods. Um, with adolescents, this anxiety trap could be anxious about a new food, becoming very angry um, if presented with the food, digging in the toes, and then avoiding the food and this feeding into the anxiety around the food. So the smiley parent part might be taken out. What we're wanting to do is the way to treat all anxiety issues. 
It's about systematic desensitization and exposure. There is no anxiety work without some level of exposure and children need to be exposed to new foods through the steps to eating. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I credit this slide to Dr. Kay Toomey, who is an American um, who has um, written and developed a program for eating around sensory oral motor skills and systematic desensitization called the SOS approach. Um, she talks about these steps from tolerating food in the room, interacting with food um, through a distal touch, it might be with a finger or with a utensil, smelling the food, eventually maybe touching the food with a full hand, to tasting and different ways of tasting food. So that might be with the lips and licking the lips or with the tongue or putting the food eventually to the mouth and then eventually eating the food. So these are some of the steps to eating. But we actually have developed another tool that we use with the children that we work with in our pediatric feeding clinic. And we work with a placemat where the child can put a plate on a large laminated placemat and look at the food and describe it. They might smell it, hold it to the mouth if they're brave enough. And maybe that's as far as they can get to the food. And for some children, just having the food on the plate and looking at it is a major challenge and that would be something to celebrate that they've, they've got that far. Other children might be brave enough to lick a food, to taste it in that way, to bite it and drop it out or bite it and hold it in the mouth for a few seconds before dropping it out or chewing it and dropping it out. We know that if children are allowed to drop out food um, after chewing it, they're more likely to try and chew it than if you, if you chew it, if you put it in your mouth, you have to eat it. So we provide that out for children. And eventually chewing and swallowing. Um, and when we're thinking about foods to present, we're thinking of a very small portion, about a teaspoon full of a non-preferred food that children can explore in this type of way uh, so as not to overwhelm them in a sensory way. So we've got a puppy placemat. We've got a kitten placemat, and actually these are, uh, are resources we've used with young children, but actually we've also um, given them to some teens who've enjoyed using them too. Um, with older youth, we may um, state it in a different way, and I've got another suggestion about that. Um, these resources we will add to a link that um, you will be able to access with the slides as well. So when we explore about food, we know that children who with restricted diets learn about food through their senses and have sensory issues with food. So we, we use that. We talk about what the food looks like, um, how it smells to them, whether it's a big or little smell. Um, with older children, we might ask them, does it look like anything else that you eat? Any, do you eat any other foods that color? Or, um, what do you think it smells like? So with younger children, is it a big or little smell? With older children, you so what do you smell when you smell that? And then if they get it to the mouth, does it feel smooth or bumpy? Does it feel like that on your lips? Or does it feel like that on your tongue? And then anticipating if it's a crunchy food or not. And um, with young children, we want to be able to hear how loud is the crunch and make it a game. And is it a big, taste or little taste, that being a sweet one or a savoury one. So we just explore all these sensory properties of food. This is an endless source of questions that we ask about. And what's so important is that we have just small quantities and not too many on the plate at once so as not to overwhelm the child. We also give parents a food rating thermometer and we let the child and the parents know that it takes at least 20 times with a new food on a different occasion to get used to the taste and texture of it. That doesn't mean learning to love the food. It means learning to accept the food as an edible one that they can eat in their diet. And so we say the more we taste the food, we more we get used to that flavor and texture. And 
not all the foods we eat are foods that we love. We also eat some foods that are edible. So we pair this with a thermometer. So when children taste foods, they can rate it from zero, which they would say is disgusting. And we would say, oh, you've got a lot of learning to do about that food. Up through, I'm still learning about this. I can almost eat it. Five would be, I can eat it just tastes okay as six and then up to eight is quite tasty and 10 is the best tasting food ever. And we tell children, look, if we were only allowed to eat eight, nine or 10, then I would only eat chocolate and ice cream and I can't. So we do have to eat other foods because our body needs them. We also need to challenge the child's narrative around the food and that's through changing our own language around food and that helps change the child's thinking around food. So whenever the child says this is disgusting, gross, um, I don't eat this, they, children have got a variety of terms for this, we would have the comeback phrases, you're still learning about that taste or that's a big new taste or flavour for you or oh to me this tastes spicy or salty. So we talk about some of the sensory properties of that food and we have to be careful that they're not value laden that it's just a neutral property. We also use the you can language rather than the can you language. So often in our clinic, we have parents who say, would you like to try this? Or maybe you would like to have this on your plate. Do you want this on your plate? When you say that to a child, you will typically get a no. So we want to state things positively. You can put that on your plate. You could give that a lick. So we don't ask permission we suggest that the child can. We also refer to the children we see as food explorers rather than restricted eaters. And here we're talking about younger children because it's really important that they don't see themselves as restricted eaters because they are just um, take on that identity. So we say to parents, the next time you tell someone about how your child is fussy or restricted or picky or they don't eat much, remember that the child listens and they start to think of themselves in that way. And the more often they hear that, the more entrenched that becomes as their identity and the more entrenched that behaviour pattern comes. So we need to really challenge how we are talking about our children and not um, talk about their restrictiveness rather how they are exploring foods. And you could say, oh, my child licked an apple the other day. And that can be something to celebrate with Nan rather than um, just focusing on the negatives. So this feeds on to that, excuse the pun. Um, but we know that children are easily discouraged by new foods. So we mm -hmm. need to remember to um, celebrate all their interactions and not just the eating. So those steps to eating that we talked about with the placemats, those are, all, those are all chances to celebrate the success. And we try to make the children feel good about themselves as food explorers. And often this will involve rewards and um, some positive gains for the child, for some incentives for exploring foods too. Um, but we tend to suggest keep them small and on the day. For older children, we need to think about screening for anorexia and bulimia and other eating disorders because we know sometimes that restricted eating patterns can look like AFID but then develop onto anorexia. So we really need to be aware of that. Um, we don't have the capacity to talk all about other eating disorders in this webinar, but um, these are important um, things to think about. We also need to screen for a choking incident because we know the treatment for that may look a little bit different. So for a child who's had a choking incident, they may, might need a little bit of um, work around that trauma and that could be um, community um, counselling or could be something like EMDR or other therapy modalities just to look at a particular trauma around choking. Um, before exploration can be done. Um, for youth, we need to do general mental health checks because we know that appetite is impacted on by other mental health difficulties like depression. Um, so we need to check 
what is happening with mood, etc. And then when it comes to working with youth around restricted diets, if they do have ARFID and not an eating disorder or something else, we need to teach them about uh, nutritional deficiencies and the impacts of that. Um, when you're thinking of motivational interviewing, you're thinking of ways to encourage someone to seek change, and that might be through becoming aware of the challenges if change doesn't happen. We also need to teach um, the youth about the anxiety and avoidance cycle. And um, I wouldn't use the smiley face one, but I would certainly just use anxiety um, and talk about how avoidance of food can feed on to more anxiety without the challenges um, to being brave and taking on new foods. So, one of the things we do with both children and youth is have a food of the week. This is where we encourage the child to choose a food to explore for the week. And we aren't particular about what it is. We tend to say not a lolly, but, um, and if you're going to have a sweet food, then alternate it with a savory the next week. So for some children, it might be a different flavor of chip that they don't eat. Um, and it might be a different flavor of muffin or crackers or whatever. We don't mind because what we're wanting to do is just increase the range. We know for some children, they are so, so picky with their range that they are brand specific. So sometimes even these small challenges are big. We then look at the steps to eating and with younger children, we might use the um, placemats um, for youth. We might just say, how does the food look to you? How does it feel? How does it smell? What is the taste? And what's it like when you chew it? And it's, once again, it's talking about the sensory properties and getting the child to know, the youth to know that you familiarize yourself with practice. So that's the trying 20 times um, and you can't only eat your favorite foods. And it's really got to be kept simple and fun um, and not be high pressured because we know that when you're stressed, then your appetite reduces. And so that doesn't help taking on uh, a new food. We also suggest that the food of the week challenge isn't a meal time it's about exploring a food because sometimes you might get to lick that food and that's a very big challenge for you and you might keep on licking it for a number of days or attempts before you get to have a bite of it and then drop it out your mouth and then a number of days doing that before you get to chew the food and this is a long slow journey we also need to remind parents it's a long slow journey and um, that parents need to look after themselves as a magic fix but that because it's so challenging for children children need to have um, rewards for the challenges that they take on as I said earlier on that ARFID is not something that um, children want to change themselves typically sometimes when they adolescents they may because they might see their mates going out to McDonald's and trying things that they won't eat. But um, for, for most of the young people we see, it's not something they want to change. So there has to be an external motivator. So for the referral pathways, um, this is for the Canterbury District Health Board and I, it may apply to the other DHBs around. Um, GP is always the first point of call and Fiona will talk more about some of the screening that a GP needs to do. Um, in Canterbury here the GP may when uh, CDHB, the Canterbury District Health Board, the GPs refer to paediatrics and that's the way into the paediatric feeding team. They're not necessarily other feeding teams around the country that operate in a similar way but that's how we work. And the GP also has the option for a referral to a community paediatric dietitian, but this is a small resource, so um, it's not done on time. And then to the mental health services, known as CAM services, we call them CAF services here in Canterbury. Um, 
they generally will only take on these children in our service if there are severe mental health challenges together with restricted eating. And here also the South Island Eating Disorders Service would take children if they're over 12 and have a serious eating disorder. And sometimes that's ARFID, very serious ARFID, or um, anorexia or another eating disorder. I'm going to hand on to Fiona now and um, we'll answer questions at the end. Thank you. Well, Ursula, thanks for giving a very thorough background into ARFID and the difference between that and anorexia. But more importantly, starting that journey with food exploration at home, because you and I know and the feeding team know that this is not a quick fix. As you said, it's not something that takes weeks or months. It can take years. And it's a uh, really is a, a, a big worry for the parents and caregivers of, of these children that their children are not eating like the rest of the family. But one of the biggest worries that they have is, is my child getting all the nutrition that they need? And because we know that this journey is going to take a long time, we have to be creative with where they're going to get nutrition from. So as public health nurses, as dietitians, as health professionals, we all know what the Ministry of Health are saying, five plus veg a day, three portions of meat a week, and so on and so forth. And these parents know these messages as well. And sometimes they sit their child next to me and they think that I'm going to be able to say, now, come on, eat a carrot. You can do it. But of course, that's not going to happen for all the reasons that um, Ursula said. And so we have to be more creative. So the most common nutrition concerns I see in this group um, would be mainly iron, um, followed next by vitamin E, then vitamin A, vitamin C, protein, calcium, B12, and also vitamin D. These would be the main nutrients of concern. So it's very difficult when a child turns up to a GP with a very concerned parent saying, my child is eating fewer than 20 foods, they're not eating fruit and vegetables, they're missing out on dairy and red meats. And yet when the GP measures their height and weight, they come out at the 50th percentile or above the 50th percentile. In fact, the vast majority of the children that I would see would be look like they were growing well and they were well nourished. However, when you look a bit deeper, and this is the same child, this child has a low vitamin A level, his vitamin E level is below normal, his hemoglobin is slightly below normal, and he is also not eating um, sufficient protein to be able to meet those protein demands of his body. So he may be growing well, but he's not eating a nutritious diet because he's missing out a vast number of um, food groups. And so using this knowledge that we've had over the last couple of years, when we have children coming into um, pediatrics who are restricted eaters, we've developed some nutritional bloods that we ask that the pediatricians get measured. And I would also ask that GPs have it get these measured as well, because very often um, the GPs will simply measure the iron studies. But if you're going to the trouble of um, bleeding a child, then we might as well do the nutritional bloods that we need to get the full picture. And these are vitamin A and E, vitamin D, iron studies, full blood count. And because we've got vitamin D, we also need magnesium, phosphate, and calcium. Now in Canterbury, there are child-friendly labs. And I would suggest that you ask parents to phone around and see when there's two phlebotomists available. So these blood results and having these nutritional bloods has really revolutionized the um, targeting of specific nutrients that we can now do for some of these children. And I know it's never a nice thing to ask for a child to have blood tests, but it does give us a wealth of information. So with these children, they are growing super well, and that's because they eat a carb-rich diet. And a carb-rich diet is very secure for them. They know that the quality control of biscuits, crackers, KFC, McDonald's, cheeseburgers, all over the world is the same. And so you can trust it. Your sensory preferences can trust it. Whereas if you eat a blueberry, one day it'll be juicy, the next it'll be squishy, then it'll be sweet, and then it will be sour. So fruit and vegetables don't have the same quality control as carbs. And as a result, they end up eating a carb-rich diet. So they look like they're growing really well, but they're just not getting those nutrients that they need. So 
We do know the Ministry of Health guidelines, but I've just put up here about what is the bare minimum that you can get away with and still get enough nutrition. And the first thing is checking out their growth because a lot of these children will be growing properly, but some won't. And so it is really um, worthwhile checking the growth and not just against one standard measurement of a a serial number of, of measurements is most useful. Ideally, I want red meat three times a week and that red meat doesn't have to be too fancy. I'd go for Cheerios or luncheon um, as some of those sources. It doesn't always have to be steak. And steak is really difficult for children to eat. It takes a lot of chewing and a lot of saliva. If we look at dairy portions, the minimum per day, ideally I'm looking for two portions a day. Remembering a portion of dairy is 250 mils of milk, 40 grams of cheese or a bottle of yogurt. And dairy provides 25% of a child's protein required for growth. And so if we've got a child without dairy in their diet, then it's likely that they're not going to be growing as well as their peers. And just while I'm on the subject of dairy, the milk alternatives that are out there, which should actually be called nut waters and coconut water, are not high in protein and don't contain sufficient protein for children to be able to grow properly, with the exception of soy milk, which um, is a fortified milk alternative. Looking for one protein serve a day, Hopefully also the child has got butter or margarine on their bread. You wouldn't believe the number of them that stop using butter or margarine on their bread. And it's a really useful source of vitamin E particularly and also vitamin A. So we encourage that back onto the breads and toasts. And if we're lucky to have a fruit or vegetable, I really hope it would be something yellow and orange because that would give us my vitamin A again. So this would be the bare minimum. But of course, we're not getting all of these things. And um, this is when... I have to look for nutrients by hook or by crook. So we have to be more creative about where these nutrients are going to come from. And so what I'm going to go through now is each of those um, nutrients that we saw at the beginning and what we need them for and where we can get them from in our diet. So, oh, no, first of all, I'm going to look at um, this interesting little slide I've put up for you for comparison between chicken nuggets and Cheerios because these are standard fare for the children Um, who are restricted because they're very predictable. It appeals to their sensory preferences. They know exactly what they're going to get every time. And I thought it was interesting to see that if you have six small cocktail sausages, you'll actually be meeting your iron requirements in the day. And they're a good source of protein. Likewise, nuggets are a good source of protein. If we look at the bottom, breakfast cereals, All the breakfast cereals are fortified with iron and some of them even have additional calcium like um, Special K and they can be a source of protein, although it's not as high biological value as as meat, it's still a source of protein. And then my favourite one on the other side, Marmite and Vegemite. Very often these children do have Marmite or Vegemite, so um, you will see their B12 um, levels are all good. Um, But there is a subtle difference between Marmite and Vegemite in that Marmite contains 10 times the amount of iron compared to Vegemite. So two milligrams per teaspoon, whereas Vegemite is 0.2 milligrams per teaspoon. And this is often a change that parents think that they can make easily with with their child. The other thing that gets a bit of stick is tomato sauce because, of course, it contains a bit of sugar. But I even saw a little boy today who said he would eat luncheon meat if only you could have tomato sauce with it. And so luncheon meat is a source of iron and protein, and I'm more than happy for him to have tomato sauce with it because tomato sauce makes food bearable. It makes you be able to take food A, add tomato sauce to it, food B becomes food C, I can eat that. And tomato sauce in itself does have some nutrition, so it's not to be brushed off lightly. If a child wants to have tomato sauce to help them eat a a food or to explore a new food, then we're all for that. So go tomato sauce. Now we're going to look at the different nutrients and iron is the the number one that we see um, most in deficit in these children. And of course, it's important because it can affect cognitive function, motor development, growth, immune function and appetite. And um, in my previous life as a dietitian with cystic fibrosis, of course, there was lots of other reasons that iron had um, implications. But with this population, we're really talking about poor dietary intake. That is the number one reason why they have iron deficiency. They have poor dietary intake because they eat very few um, red meats. And so we need to be creative. So if there is no meat in the diet, 
there are other foods that you can get sufficient iron in your diet from. Now, if a child has got um, an iron deficiency, the GP or paediatrician will want to su um, supplement with an iron supplementation. Often these are poorly tolerated and um, they end up not being given. And so we do need to work away with what else can we provide from the diet. So um, my favorite one is to suggest Milo. So the Kiwi way of making Milo is usually one teaspoon of Milo with half milk and half water. But if you make it according to the instructions on the tin, which is three teaspoons of Milo and a, blue, and a mug of blue top milk, you get 2.4 milligrams of iron, which is getting on for 25% of your requirements. All the breakfast cereals are fortified. So I love it when children have breakfast cereal in the morning. I don't care what breakfast cereal it is, as long as it's a breakfast cereal. And if they're having it with milk, that's all the better. Um, sausages um, are often derided as being a poor nutritional source. But again, one sausage, 1.5 milligrams of iron. So if that's what the child will eat, we'll allow them to have sausages. Some of the baby foods can be useful for iron supplementation. And I am like a bit of a food detective going around the supermarket, checking the backs of packets for other foods, which I suddenly find are fortified. And the only organics, biscotti, two of them, four milligrams of iron, or the um, fortified baby rices, again, are great for fortification. One square meal I came across recently in a journal. They were um, giving it to some of the teenage girls on the North Island and um, because they had been iron deficient and um, it had raised their iron levels, they were able to learn better. And one square meals are also fortified with a range of other micronutrients. And then, of course, I've got my marmite down there on the bottom. So it is possible, by hook or by crook, to get enough iron from other foods if the child doesn't eat meat. Calcium, so with the children in regards to their calcium intake, probably about 50% of them are meeting their calcium intakes and 50% of them don't have any dairy in their diet. So these are some ideas of how we might be able to maximise the dairy that they do having. And one of the easy ones is to change from blue top milk to the yellow top milk because um, it's calcium fortified. The so-called plastic cheeses, again, are great for calcium. Up and go, one up and go, you've almost got your whole calcium requirement in one drink. Um, Milo is there again, 400 milligrams along with um, some milk. And I spotted in the supermarket that there was a can of tuna, which was fortified, 830 milligrams of um, calcium in that can of tuna. Special K, as I mentioned, too. So there's lots of foods that are fortified. It's just a matter of finding what's going to fit to that child's sensory preference and what are they going to be able to manage. Sometimes the issue is too much dairy and it's not unusual for me to be presented with a child with, who's taking maybe a litre or 1,200 mils of milk. And what we really want to do there is to bring that milk down to the physiological norm for their age, which is normally going to be 500 mils of milk plus another dairy serve like a yoghurt or cheese. Once you've done that, it probably takes a couple of days for their appetite to kick in and for the parents to see the difference in reducing that milk intake. It doesn't happen the next day. So um, that's worthwhile remembering that when you reduce those milk intakes, it can take a couple of days for the effect on the appetite to filter through. There is sometimes some controversy around fruit yogurts versus dairy foods. But from my perspective, I'm just wanting the nutrients out of these foods. And the main nutrients I want out of these foods are the calcium and the protein. And so when I did a comparison of a fruit yogurt and a chocolate dairy food, they come out very, very similar. And um, in fact, the fruit yogurt in this case actually had more sugar than um, the chocolate dairy food. So if I have a child who has chocolate dairy food and the mother is fretting that I want them to eat a fruit yogurt, because it's the calcium and the protein that I want. She can try the fruit yogurt by all means, but if the child doesn't accept it, then we've still got that chocolate yogurt. It's still providing those nutrients that I need to help the child grow and provide enough calcium. Just a little side note that our food labeling laws in New Zealand aren't very sophisticated when it comes to sugar. And when you look at sugar on the back of a yogurt label, it will um, say total sugar, but in that, that will include lactose, fructose, and sucrose. At the moment, you can't differentiate those sugars. 
Vitamin A is one of the trickiest vitamins in the group of deficiencies that are possible with these children. Now, we don't see it very often, but when we do see it, it is the most serious one and we have to um, act on it. So with these children is diet that is the main cause for um, vitamin A deficiency and it can cause permanent eye damage, which we don't want. Now, it should be relatively easy to get enough vitamin A if you think about it um, from this graph here. If you've got a cup of milk, you've got 70 um, micrograms or retinal equivalents of vitamin A. If you've got your margarine and your butter, you've got another 140. Um, if you have a, a small serve of vegetables, three, over 300 micrograms. And so as a bare minimum, I put two dairy portions plus one butter and margarine and one vegetable, and you should be getting enough vitamin A. But of course, we know these children are not eating fruit and vegetables. They may also not be eating any dairy. And so they can be at risk of developing vitamin A deficiency. And if that comes up on a screening test, then I think that the child should probably be referred to paediatrics for further um, investigation, but also to have their eyesight checked. And there are a number of optometrists particularly in Canterbury, who will do that test for free. And the mother or father would need to say that uh, the child has got proven vitamin A deficiency and that other um, optometrists will do it free with a community services card so that we can get this checked and get on top of it and get some supplementation started. Vitamin C isn't one of the um, vitamins that we typically check for in those Bloods because it can be right, relatively easy to get enough vitamin C. In fact, in Scotland, where I came from, they get all their vitamin C practically from fried potatoes and chips. So you don't have to be eating a lot of fruit and vegetables. It does come from a, a lot, a range of a variety of foods. And then we have Milo popping up again as a source of vitamin C. So um, tomato sauce, um, any juices that they have. I know you don't normally hear dietitians talking about juice. But if they don't have any fruit and vegetables, it can be a good conduit to getting um, some vitamin C and some, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to have fruit and vegetables in, again, they're perfect for vitamin C. Vitamin E is a deficiency that we see very often in this group, again, because they're not eating a lot of those um, foods like um, butter and margarine and not eating eggs and nuts. And um, we're not quite sure about the um, clinical significance of low vitamin E in this group of alpha children. However, we do try and um, supplement. And so ideally we want them to try and increase the amount of vitamin E in their diet by including, including more but butter and margarine, by asking their parents to change over to maybe a sunflower oil. They might be able to use a wheat germ oil, although it's got a very strong taste. Some of the breakfast cereals are fortified with um, vitamin E. And if that still doesn't meet the requirements that we need, then it is possible to buy vitamin E capsules. And we suggest no more than um, two or three a week. And you snip the capsule and squeeze it onto some preferred foods like chicken nuggets or toast. And on the left, there's a list of the foods that are typically high in vitamin E. And you can see they're not high in the range of foods that children with restricted eaters would choose to have. B12 is one of those funny ones. I rarely see B12 deficiency in this group. And I think it's all the breakfast cereal, Marmite and Vegemite that they have. And um, also if they've got dairy products in their life, then B12 is, is really a problem, but it does happen. And um, it is something to watch out for. Starting Vegemite or Marmite would um, help improve that and um, starting a general children's multivitamin as well. So whilst we're still learning about foods, and it's going to take a long time for many of these children to be eating a full diet, I am perfectly comfortable with suggesting to parents that they purchase a children's multivitamin. And one of the questions I usually ask is, if your child had to take a medicine how would they take it? What form would that be in? And that's when they might come up and say, oh, we would crush it and add it to yogurt. A lot of them take melatonin like that, or um, he can take Pamol, so he will take a syrup, or he would take it in a gummy version. So I try and match the vitamin supplement to the child's sensory preference. And I've got a couple here that are options. 
and I encourage um, yourselves or parents to do their own research. Most of these are available from the supermarket, and I like it when it's available from the supermarket because there's no big high sell around them, and they're usually um, very reasonably priced. So the first one is the Centrum for Kids, and it comes in strawberry or orange flavour. And um, these are chewable, but you can actually crush them and add them to juice or milk and um, give them in a, in a small um, amount of, of juice so that the child can take them in that way. There are chewable ones. The Sanderson Zoo is um, a good general multivitamin with 15 milligrams of iron in it. And also the Health Reads Kids Care, that's got about 1.5 milligrams of iron in it. Same with the Centrum, they've both got a small amount of iron in it, which again, it's all that layering. If you can have a Milo, you can have Marmite, if you've got your Centrum, you're just layering it up and you're gradually getting all of the iron that you need in the day. Gummies are probably the most preferred by children. However, they don't contain any iron. I haven't found a gummy multivitamin um, to date that contains iron, but please feel free and let me know if you do find them. Um, but they are, you know, just for those all round general ones with vitamin E, bit of vitamin A, vitamin D, they're fine to have. There are some options online and there is um, the Nutristart powder option available online, which can be added to yogurt or milk and cereals. And then there are liquid ones such as the Pro-Life Orange one I've got there, which um, if you've got a child who can take syrup, then that's good. Then we have to go for the nutrient-specific supplements. So if you've done a blood test and you can see that that child is iron deficient, there's a couple of iron options there for you. You've got the iron melts available from the supermarket. They can be chewed, but they do tend to taste a bit sherbety because of the citric acid that's in them. Um, otherwise, they can be crushed and added to water or juice. The Centrum Increment Syrup is useful for those children that will tolerate um, syrup. And then there is an iron gummy from Radiance. Now, all of those are only providing five milligrams of iron, which is very much below the level that a child would need if they were needing to supplement out of iron deficiency. But it, at least this is something that be, can be going on as an everyday option. Please remember to um, remind parents to keep these medications out of reach because um, iron medication can be one of the biggest forms of poisoning in children because they think they're lollies. So they must be kept out of reach. For vitamin A and E, if we need to supplement those, I generally go for one of the oil-filled capsules. Children are unlikely to swallow them, so we get them uh, parents to snip and add to a preferred food. And the dose is usually, as I said, one capsule two or three times per week. I'm just going to talk very quickly about energy fortification because I see we're running out of time. Um, there are a small amount of these children who will um, falter and um, not grow as well as their um, other cohorts. So if this is the case, what we can get you to do is to add or suggest that the parents add one teaspoon of oil, butter or margarine per half cup of savoury solids, like soup, casserole, pasta, rice or potatoes. And there's a little thumb size there showing you what a teaspoon looks like. And that will give the child an extra 40 calories. So the other option is that you could ask them to eat another apple, but I think that eating um, a teaspoon of margarine would be much more preferable. Also adding cream. Cream can be added to soup, yogurt, tinned fruit, custard, desserts, breakfast cereal, and a tablespoon of cream is another 60 calories. There are options in the supermarket, which um, are all very useful for adding extra calories for children and easy to consume. And um, there's a vast range there of the different custards, the fancy milks, and um, some of the, the higher range ones. And of course, parents can always make their own milkshakes with milk and a bit of ice cream, a bit of pureed fruit, and a bit of honey or sugar. Options for ready-made milk. So I think this is just a, a nice little comparison that shows you that um, there are calories in these milks, some of them more than others. And when we go down to the Puhoi and the Lewis Road Valley ones, it might make you think second uh, again about buying these for yourself, 1.33 calories per mil. Um, so they're just for special occasions. Or if you have a child in the house who's faltering, maybe you could buy them then. And the Lewis Road chocolate butter, 6.8 calories per mil. The last thing to talk about today is management of food burnout. And this is 
what we see very often because these children eat such a restricted range, they get very fed up with those um, foods that they're eating and they burn out on them. And then when they burn out on those foods, they're typically lost from their diet and it can be permanently lost. So what happens then is that that food is then lost and it makes finding that child's nutrition even more difficult. So we want to prevent food burnout and we use a very simple tool for doing that. The way we suggest parents prevent food burnout is to offer only one particular food only every other day. So it's like an alternative um, menu. So if today you've got cornflakes, tomorrow you will have wheat bix. And then the next day you'll have cornflakes and then wheat bix. So you've got that 48 hour menu going on. If the child doesn't have a wide enough range, then they can take their preferred foods and make a little tweak to it, a little change. Maybe you could cut the bread in a slightly different shape. Maybe as the stack of pancakes there, you could put a little bit of food coloring in the pancakes. Maybe you could put different sprinkles on the bread. So there's all sorts of things that you can do to just make a small change so the child notices it. It feeds into their sensory brain, small enough for them to still eat the food, but not big enough, so big that they will have a meltdown. So those that's a key message with regards to helping to protect the child's range. Okay, so I think we're almost at the end and we're ready for our questions. Thank you, Isola and um, Helena. Yeah, sorry, I'm having a bit of a mind block. Anyway, I was actually riveted by the um, session. It was fantastic. Thank you. I think that brought up some uh, really, really useful um, information and some tools for parents. But we've got some questions that um, have come through. So some of them you possibly have already answered. So we'll start with some that I think might be simple to answer. Um, one is, uh, how do you best advise managing food fatigue? And I think that might have been the last. Oh, slide. the food fatigue, yes. Yeah, we yeah. would know it by food. It's known by many different names. So food burnout, food fatigue. Food jags. Food, food jags, yes, mm -hmm. food jags. So, yeah, it's about trying to get that um, variation into that child's diet and um, just using small things or or um, fun things like cookie cutters, you know, with, with their toast or adding a little bit of food colouring to um, the yoghurt or some sprinkles to the yoghurt. So it's just little things. Different flavoured yoghurts, different flavoured crisp, different flavoured biscuits. These are all the sorts of things that we would suggest. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarity from somebody. Sorry, can you clarify? Did you say with the food of the week that this shouldn't be done during a meal time? So with the food of the week... Um, what we're talking about is a time to explore non-preferred foods. So often meal times are about getting the volume in that the child needs, and you can use that as an additional time to explore food. So sometimes we can suggest to parents and children that the child can choose one of the foods that everyone else is eating to explore, and they can have a teaspoon of that food to explore. But if it's about getting their volume of food and that they're needing to survive, um, that's the meal times. Food exploration for food of the week is another time, and often a good time might be an afternoon tea time after school or something to explore food, so it's not replacing a meal time. Thanks for that. What about breast milk? We are seeing lots of children over one who are having lots of breast milk and not much food. Mm. Any answers to that yeah, one? Yeah, I'm seeing a few of those as well. So uh, over one, the um, age-appropriate volume of, of milk is still around about 500 mils, and you would be expecting that the child would be having um, a breastfeed on waking and before their sleeps during the day and before bed, and hopefully not too many times overnight, because when I see that there is a lot of breastfeeding going overnight, then typically I see that there's not a lot of eating going on during the day. So we want to try and pull back those nighttime feedings. So you're looking for in that young age, probably at least four breastfeeds still going on, waking in before those two sleeps and, and, and before bed. So it really needs to be pulled into a stricter routine and that food is offered first. And hopefully um, the parents can make that food presentation a bit of fun. Maybe not always a bit about um, eating that food, but maybe if there's some yogurt put on the, the child's um, plate, with some fruits or strawberries or bananas, the child can have some fun squishing that or um, driving things through, and then maybe they might get tempted to lick their fingers. So 
It's just about those little tastes at the beginning and hopefully just bringing that, those milk volumes down to the age-appropriate volume for over 12 months, which can be tricky. So this is sort of the second question along that line. With a child who is 18 months and has some of the symptoms for Ashford you've described, they're still having formula. Should I encourage formula or ask them to move to blue or maybe yellow top cow's milk? So when we have children who are really restricted, I think that we tend to say just keep with the formula milks meantime, but make sure that they're, it's not displacing food so that you've still got no more than 500 mils of formula milk in the day and that there's plenty of room for other foods. And the main reason for that is these formula um, milks are fortified with iron and protein and zinc, which are typically nutrients they're not getting. So I would say continue with the, the formula milk meantime. At the 18 month stage, that's peak time for picky eating. Hopefully that yes. child will grow out of yes. that. So and it's also a good idea with those young children to play with food and make food fun mm -hmm. and not to stress too much about it. Present the child with food and eat with them. In the same way, when we get a, um, a child onto a multivitamin, it just takes the stress out of things for parents because they know that they've got their cover, they're covering their nutritional basis. And so it's going to take a long time to learn about foods, but he's taking this or she's taking this vitamin, so we've got time to be able to learn about foods. And um, particularly for those children that I see are, that are on the autism spectrum, um, for these parents, I say that this may well be lifelong. You may have to have this child on this vitamin for the rest of their life. But for children who are more AFID, we hope that that won't be the case, that their range will gradually improve through different kinds of sensory issues going on there. Mm, excellent. Um, this is a question about length, lengthy meal times. You mentioned not having lengthy meal times. What about children who themselves sit there and take forever to eat despite encouragement and having been given shorter time frames to normalise eating pattern? What are your recommendations? Okay, so we don't want meals to become a punishment with how long they are. So if a child's happily sitting for 45 minutes and eating, then that's fine if the child's happy. However... I would say it would be worth doing a little experiment. You could tick off the number of mouthfuls that happen in the first half hour and the number that happen thereafter. And then you think, is it worthwhile to stay in the chair that much longer um, if they aren't eating terribly much for the rest of the time? Um, because you don't want the child's life to be all around food. You want the child to be playing and doing a lot of other things. And sometimes when they're up and down in the high chair, meal after meal, very lengthy meal times. Um, it's one of the reasons why children find foods challenging. They don't develop a good relationship with food. It's because it becomes too intense and mm. too much pressure. So I would say <laughs> do, do an experiment. Check out how much they're eating in the first hour, half hour. Check out how much they're eating after that. Um, and if it's not worth staying in the seat, move on. Um, and keep the child happy. Okay, thanks. Right, this is quite a long um, question, but sort of has had an, um, an add-on add to it, so I'll read it. I've been a paediatric nurse for many years. My child, who's primary age, was diagnosed with failure to thrive, anorexia of infancy, and was nasogastric fed for a long time. He's now maintaining his weight and eating a lot better. However, he's predominantly eating brown foods, though he has begun to eat zucchini, carrot, and onion, if it's grated. With pasta, with pasta, with bacon and cheese, or in an omelette, approximately twice a week. The little person also has ASD and ADHD. I get so sick of people labelling my child a fussy eater when I know it is due to his multiple surgeries, tube feeding trauma, and additional diagnosis. It's really hard to have a child with these challenges, yet I can support other children with found out to eat a full and healthy diet. What is something you have found to help parents deal with the guilt associated so that we're in a better space? to support our children other than counselling, et cetera, which is now, um, I mean, like, is there a catchphrase type of thing? Do you know, I, I can take my hat off to this person. They're dealing with multiple challenges um, simultaneously, and we have some parents are, who are facing these same challenges who would really resonate with that. Um, I don't know that there is a an easy, quick catchphrase, but... It is about, we know that you're 
as parents are doing your best, you're facing all these challenges and the fact that you still have an alive child, given all those challenges, is something to celebrate. You know, they, they're getting their nutrition to still be here and sometimes there isn't a fix and, um, with so many multiple challenges and it is just about the nutrition to keep them growing and... Um, Yes, thank you for that. Uh, it's a it's a big question and, and an important one, but we haven't got a an easy answer to I it. think I really quite like that word, the food explorer. I haven't food heard, explorer. Of the, heard that one before, so from my it's, perspective, it's so it was much great. more positive. They're more positive than yeah. the, you know, yeah. the picky eater, fussy eater. We try and make yeah. everything more positive, yeah. even eating chicken nuggets and Cheerios. It's, yay. So the response was, uh, thank you so much. I actually cried hearing what you were saying about the nutritional content of food. Such a relief and so validating to know it's actually okay to be giving these foods as the original um, question about being a peas nurse in a mum of a food explorer. This is honestly amazing and just so freeing of the guilt. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Um, one other question. Uh, I see parents running after children around the house to offer them food. What are your thoughts? Well, we could probably both answer this. Um, often we tell our children, our parents, that children do well to have six meals a day. So that's um, breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea, dinner and supper. Um, and have a kitchen closed between times because we know that children who just graze and have small bits of food learn to satiate themselves on a on a lick of an apple. Or, yeah, they can um, actually eat 50% less. At graze, they can eat 50% less than a child who's got more set meal patterns. So, yeah. So, yeah, we're really wanting to develop children's hunger drive. And um, so to have meal times, kitchen is closed until the next opportunity. And if there's six opportunities, there's plenty of opportunities. The other thing about family meal times is that children learn so much from the people around them and they learn about the foods that the other people are eating and um, they learn it's family meal times are not only about eating they're about communication and about hearing about your day and all sorts of things so it, we love it when families eat together it doesn't need to be in a dining table it can be sitting um, around the sofa or on the floor but um, it is important for families to come together and eat a meal together because there's so much more to eating than just simply eating the food. Thank you. This is from Gemma. What do you suggest for a child who's been through the food, food exploration you've covered today, but as a result has lost even more safe foods? Said child cannot be praised with successes because it is perceived as pressure and more safe foods are lost. The children who gag and vomit children who won't eat around anyone else, for example, at school or birthday functions, et cetera. Mm. You know, we, we do have children who have multi-complex challenges and um, sometimes the picture is bigger than, than the food. just the food and there's a lot of other anxieties. Um, the recommendations we made around the food exploration is evidence-based and has been quite well researched in um, particularly in the states um, and the methods to manage um, anxiety and anxiety around food is through gradual exposure and we don't like to see children lose foods and um, it is important to make the children feel good about themselves for that food exploration um, Sometimes the complexity might mean that the child might need more help um, than what can be provided in a sort of short clinic. Mm -hmm. They may need other anxiety help, etc. Yeah, I agree. The, I mean, the clinic that we provide is is a very um, small resource. It's only four hours a week, and we we. Um, often see two, two groups of, of children in that and we, we can't hope to cover all those mm. issues for all of the families. Yeah, and our job we see primarily as um, encouraging and teaching the parents to become the food therapist for their children because we haven't, as a clinic, got the capacity to see the children for the long journey 
and I guess as public health nurses and um, public nurses, um, etc., it's also the job to upskill the parents to help their children, um, and that's what we see our job as. Yeah. Um, that's the important part. That's good, and I think there's been some useful um, tips and resources today that's been provided, which will be available on the presentation. But there were some um, key messages that the um, presenters would like us to leave you with for today, if there are no more questions, which there doesn't appear to be coming through. So thanks for your time. Um, the key messages are food exploration needs to happen at home, um, not out, outside. Um, there's one more question, so we'll come back to that. Nutrition is important, and that we achieve that through vitamin and mineral supplements if the nutrition is inadequate. And I think um, Fiona explained that very well um, with all the options around how to get that in. Uh, lose no foods and using that 48 hour um, menu is a really good way of making sure that um, that food fatigue doesn't actually creep into these children who are um, you know really restrictive in their food food regime. so those I think they were really useful tips there's just one question uh, additional which was from Gemma again the children who won't eat around others any tips for that so I would wonder about um, some level of social anxiety linked to that um, issue. Um, I think it's also about exposure. It's trying to figure out what is it that eating around others, um, what is it that's driving that? Is it the, the sensory noise. properties, the noise of the others eating, the smells of other people's foods, etc.? So trying to figure out that and coming to some sort of a compromise can be helpful for some families it might be eating in the same room not at the same table because um, the sensory properties of the food is too challenging so when we're looking at our um, exposure placemat even the looking at food or the smelling of it in the same on the same table is too challenging for that child so it's about working out how you can compromise with that and for that to be the first challenge. So we've had um, some children where the major focus has been getting the child to the table, and that's before we've even started with the um, food exploring. That's been the main exposure task and the rewarded task is for the child to be at the table when others are eating, not to eat the food. So the journey can be quite long. Absolutely. <laughs> and tortuous, mm -hmm. yeah, and lots of stamina required, resilience. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, so just to wrap up, thank you for your time today and also for the people who have dialed into the webinar. Um, we had around about 120 people um, register, so I hope that um, we've had a couple of messages saying many thanks for the session and looking forward to receiving the slides. So um, that's, that's fantastic.